If you would, turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 43. Psalm 43 is our text. We are... We began a series last week with George speaking, um, and we're spending the summer looking at some of our favorite psalms or psalms that um, have spoken to us. And so there's about five or six speakers that will be speaking this summer, and we've all just said, this is a psalm that has ministered to me. This is a psalm that I've always enjoyed. And so it's more of a devotional style. Um, not a lot, we're not really getting in depth. I know George... George will spend, spend like 30, 40 hours preparing for last week's message and did a phenomenal job, by the way. That was, if you missed that message, um, I would highly encourage you to watch it online. But, um, but over the course of the next several weeks, each of us are going to share psalms that have spoken to us. Some of them are famous. Some of them are psalms that you guys might have heard growing up as a child. Others are not so famous, but they were psalms that mean something to us. And so this morning, we're going to continue in that series, and we're going to look at a psalm um, and it's the 43rd Psalm. Let me read the five verses that are in there, and then we'll just uh, meditate on these words for a little bit. Psalm 43, verse 1, Vindicate me, O God. Defend my cause against an ungodly people. From the deceitful and unjust man deliver me. For you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you rejected me? Why do I go about mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and I will praise you with the lyre, my God, my God. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. It was a tragedy that riveted the attention of the entire nation. In the early morning of May 23, 1939, the newest submarine in the U.S. Atlantic Fleet was returning to port. The USS Squalus had just completed 18 successful test dives, but the 19th one had gone terribly wrong. A ventilation valve was left open and water gushed in into the rear components, and it crushed half the crew and drowned half of them. Thirty-three people were remaining, and they were trapped off the New Hampshire coast in 243 feet of water, freezing, wet, running out of air. They released a messenger signal and waited for five high-anxiety hours before the USS Sculpin arrived, followed by other rescue boats. The situation became more frantic as seawater became mixed with leaky battery acid in the forward component of the submarine and it filled the sub with a deadly chlorine gas. The crew managed to seal off the compartment, but their precious oxygen supply was now poisoned, and doomed sailors prayed fervently in the darkness of their submerged tomb. On the seas above, Naval Commander Charles Momsen made the desperate decision to attempt an untested new device called the McCain Rescue Chamber. And this device, this diving bell, was designed to attach to the disabled sub's hatch and to ferry survivors to the surface, at least in theory, has never been done before. It was a dangerous enough that the Navy frogmen would have to go down about 300 feet into water attach it watertight to the hatch, but sailors would then have to climb back over wreckage in the pitch black darkness toward the sealed off chamber full of de deadly gases. And after each small group was ferried up, this entire process would have to be repeated over and over. Experts said that the chances of a successful rescue were a thousand to one. The oxygen inside the squalus was almost gone when the divers attached the escape bell to the hatch. And as they were attaching it, they heard tapping on the inside of the inside hull of the sub. A question in Morse code was being relayed by the sailors inside, and here's what the message said. They said, do we have any reason to hope? 
Do we have any reason to hope? The rescue that took place in the hair-raising hours afterward is a stuff for heroic legends. All of them were rescued. They were saved using untested equipment considered primitive now. Some 70, 80 years later, it is still considered the greatest submarine rescue in history. But the Morse code from the trapped sailor still ask the haunting question, do we still have any reason to hope? Anonymous philosopher scribbled some graffiti on the wall and he said, a man can live 30 days without food, three days without water, five minutes without air, but he cannot live for a single moment without hope. Julius Caesar overcame odds that would have crushed other people and when someone asked him the secret to his staying power, he replied, while I breathe, I can only hope. See, the truth is, once we start hoping, we might as well stop breathing. The Apostle Paul wrote that there are only three things that have staying power. It is faith, it is hope, it is love. These are the only three things that abide. We live in a world that sometimes feel like a broken submarine at the bottom of the ocean, but the problem is there are a lot of poisons corrupting the dwindling oxygen of our lives. We lay awake in the darkness, finding it harder to breathe in, in our hyperventilating anxiety, tapping out the message of the trap, do we have reason to hope? Almost a thousand years before Jesus came to the earth, born in a manger, the sons of Korah were trapped. Their enemies mocked them, and they mocked the God that they trusted. But the sons of Korah composed a song of hope to sing in their prison cells. The song is recorded in the 42nd and the 43rd Psalm. There's one stanza that's repeated over and over in both of these psalms, in 42, it's recorded twice. In 43, it's recorded once. Verse 5, it says, Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall rise again and praise Him, my salvation and my God. I don't know about you, but maybe this morning your soul is cast down. Maybe there are things in your life that causes your guts to churn in turmoil. See, the sons of Korah would tell you that you do have reason to hope. You do have reason to trust. You do have reason to believe if your hope is in God. We learn a lesson from the sons of Korah that's this, that hope speaks louder than despair. So you can come to church and you can sing songs that lift up our souls, and we can read scriptures that give us hope, and then we go out into a world that's full of negative talk, bad news, and prophets of doom. And despair and hopelessness rushes in like a water in a submerged submarine. It begins to crush us. It begins to drown us. The voices of despair never stop talking to the sons of Korah. Who were these men? And why would they write a song of hope in a hopeless situation? These sons of Korah, they were worship leaders. They were from the tribe of Levi. They, they were the ones who would write the songs that the people of Israel would sing. They were the worship band in the temple. They led the choir. They planned the weekly worship gathering. They were the ones who were intimate with God and would lead others to get close and intimate with God. Everything was going well for them. They were leading the congregation in worship. Church was going well, and all of a sudden something terrible happened. Around 800 B.C., the northern tribes of Israel invaded the southern tribes, and they plundered the land. You can read the story in 2 Kings 14, but the northern tribes came in and destroyed Jerusalem. 2 Kings 14 says they destroyed the temple. They seized all the gold, the silver. They took all of the items in the temple of the house of God. Then they took the southern tribes as captive 
and took him back to Samaria. Historians have pieced together archaeological evidence that lets us know that the victorious king returned north with hostages in chain. And among these hostages were these sons of Korah. And the king took him to the mountain range in the far reaches of northern Israel. And they were put into penal colonies and forced to labor in chain gangs. They suffered in exile for years until the southern Jews could scrape together enough money to pay for their ransom. Some of these sons of Korah would never be able to go back to the temple and worship again. So you, don't, you and I don't have to imagine how they felt because Psalm 42 and 43 tells us exactly how they feel. Next week, we're going to be looking at Psalm 42, but we begin by looking at the 43rd Psalm. I don't know about you, but how would you feel if you were never able to come back to church again? What if you could never sing another song with brothers and sisters or take communion or hear another sermon? In Psalm 42, verse 3, they say, the sons of Korah write, My tears have been my food day and night. And in Psalm 43, 5, it says, Why are you cast down, my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Imagine spending your whole life in the joy of temple worship, gifted by God as a musician and a worshiper, and then all of a sudden you're never allowed to go back into the house of God again. Maybe today you feel that there are dreams in your life, there are hopes in your life that you are wanting and hoping for, but they seem to be shut in your face. There are things that you asking God for, but it seems like he's absolutely silent and not answering. Maybe you're in a relationship with your family, and it's not exactly what you hoped for. Hope can be dashed, or someone you love has broken your heart. So you can understand how the sons of Korah felt as they were on the chain gang, far from family, from friends, from country, from church. Exile is a lonely place especially when the voices of despair are mocking your hope. See, if you can identify with the sons of Korah, listen again to their voices and then hear the only voice that matters. And what we'll see in our text is, we'll see the sons of Korah talk about the voices of hopelessness, and then they'll contrast that with the voices of hope. And we'll look at both of them this morning, the voices of hopelessness. You see, it's bad enough that the sons of Korah are far away from their beloved temple. It's bad enough that they're far away from home. But their exile is made worse by the taunting of the people around them. Look at verse 1 and verse 2. It says, Vindicate me, O God. Defend my cause against an ungodly people. From the deceitful and unjust man deliver me. For you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you rejected me? Why do I go mourning about the oppression of my enemy? See, when life gets hard, it's hard to stay focused on the positive without hearing all the negative talk, right? But sometimes when life gets hard, it's to add injury to insult. Other people begin to throw in more negative talk into your life and discourages you even more, Oscar Wilde once wrote, all of us live in the gutter, but only some of us choose to look at the stars. See, when we're in the gutter, like the sons of Korah, we keep hope by looking at the star. But some people in our lives keep reminding us that because we're in the gutter, the whole world is a gutter, that there are no stars above, there is no God of the stars, that our life is full of hopelessness and despair. And this is what the sons of Korah were hearing. And they mention in our psalm three voices of despair, three voices of hopelessness. Number one, they talk about the insults of people. They talk about the insults of people. Verse one, vindicate me, O God, defend my cause against a ungodly people. The sinners, the cynics, the mockers, the skeptics, they are taunting the sons of Korah in their chains. 
They remind me of the Philistines in the story of Samson 300 years earlier. Delilah had cut off the hair of Samson and they poked out his eyes and they put him in chains and they dressed him like a clown and they paraded him in front of all the people and mocked him day in and day out. And they, finally they brought him to the temple of their god Dagon for some cheap entertainment. And thousands crowded into the temple to mock the warrior who once killed a thousand Philistines with the, jaw, the jawbone of a donkey. And they mocked him with crude jokes and they made fun of his God. They joked that the God of Israel was powerless to save Samson. The pitiful Samson cried out, said, God, please remember me. Please strengthen me once again, just this one time, God. Samson wanted to be vindicated. More than that, he wanted God to be vindicated before the skeptics who mocked his existence and his power. And you know the story. God answered his prayer. Blind and powerless, Samson was supercharged with supernatural strength, and he grabbed a hold of the pillars in that temple, and with a mighty shout, he brought down the entire house of ungodliness on himself and the thousands of mockers killing them all. Look at the despairing cry of the sons of Korah in our text. In fact, if you go to Psalm 42, verse 10, it says, As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me, while they say to me all day long, Where is your God? They mock him day and night. Your God's going to rescue you? Where is he? Your God's going to deliver you? then why are you in this situation? Your God's all-powerful? Then why are you suffering like this? Your God can heal? Then why are you dying? They mock him. That verse in Psalm 42.10 is repeated during the crucifixion of Jesus. The criminals on either side of Jesus mocked him with the exact same words. Where is your God? Tell him to save you. Tell him to save you, and then while you're at it, save us as well. The Roman executioners joined in the mocking. The religious leaders of Israel also joined in. They said, if you're the Son of God, then come down from the cross. And Jesus cries out almost the same words. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me? See, we all know what it's like to be slandered by others. We all know what it's like to have negative talk around us. We're hoping for something. We're dreaming for something. We're working for something. And it makes no sense, but we know that this is our dream and this is our hope. But then there's all of a sudden, whether it's friends or family or people in our lives, that say, you can't do that. You can't go there. That's, you're never going to make it. And you're never going to succeed. We know what it's like to have negative people in our life discourage us and and try to distract us from doing what God's called us to do. After a while, we begin to believe the lies, causing us to fall into despair. You guys know the children's rhymes, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. But the reality is if you've lived long enough, you know that names do break us. Names do hurt us. The words of people do affect the things that we do, they can destroy us. They're far worse than sticks and stones because they destroy our thrive or our desire to continue. So the sons of Korah begin by dealing with the insults of people. But it gets worse from there because the second thing you notice is you see that God is silent. It's the silence of God that gets them even more upset. Verse 2 of 43 says, For you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you rejected me? See, it's bad enough when people slander us. It's bad enough when other people talk negative toward us. But it's even worse when you pray to God and He's silent. When you say, God, I'm pleading with you. I'm asking you to move. I'm asking you to work. And you get no response back. It's 
absolutely dead and absolutely quiet, it's bad enough to feel rejected by people. It's worse to feel rejected by God. Verse 9 of Psalm 42, the psalmist writes, says, I say to God, my rock, why have you forsaken me? C.S. Lewis, who by now you're familiar, if you've been here a while, you know I quote him a lot, but he wrote of the despair that he felt after his wife died from cancer. He wrote a book called A Grief Observed, and he said, the worst thing of all is that you cry out in your grief for some relief, and all you get in response is the silence of God. That's the ultimate feeling of rejection. And let's be honest, every one of us has felt that at some time or another in our lives. Maybe it's a person that's sick and you prayed for God to heal and he didn't. Maybe it's a financial situation and you asked God for, to provide and he was silent. Maybe it was a marital struggle and you asked for God to work in your marriage and he wasn't speaking. It was silent. All of us have felt that. And it's those times that the enemy of the soul will come around to whisper in our ear, how can you call yourself a good Christian when you react to God's silence in doubt and anger? But remember this, even in his deepest agony, even Jesus felt that God had forsaken him. And yet he did the one thing that you and I must do when the voices of despair are answered by the silence of God. When Jesus felt God reject him, when Jesus felt that God was not responding, he ended his words, he said, into your hands I commit my spirit. In other words, God, at this moment you seem silent, but I know you're bigger than me. I know you know exactly what you're doing. I will still trust you to take care of me. Even inside, I am full of doubt and despair and anguish. I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know you're in control of my life. I know that if you're silent right now, there's a purpose behind this. I know if you're letting me go through this, there is something you are doing in me and through me, and ultimately, end of the day, you will be glorified in it. So help me to trust you. Help me to believe that you are working. Number three, it's the sorrow of our hearts. See, as if the despairing voices that bombard us from the outside are not bad enough, and that the silence of God is not unnerving enough, our negative self-talk is more than enough to drive hope away. The sons of Korah ask in verse 2, why do I go about mourning? Why do I go about crying? So you don't really need others to mock us. You don't even need the devil to accuse you. We're quite capable of beating ourselves up by our, all by ourselves. You know, even Jesus struggled with this in his humanity. He confessed to his disciples in Matthew 26. He said, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. In other words, he's saying, I really want to just die. That's what Jesus is saying. This is a suicidal despair. If you've ever felt so overwhelmed by hopelessness that you didn't want to go on, you can take comfort in the fact that Jesus did too. This is why I'm never too quick to judge when Christians fall into depression or contemplate suicide. But there's good news. In the midst of the voices of despair, the sons of Korah finally hear something else. And in that moment, they hear the voice of hope. Can I be honest? Sometimes... I don't hear the voice of God 
Not because God isn't speaking, but it's because I'm speaking too much. I will go on and on and on to God about all the problems that I'm facing, all the struggles that I'm going, and I will keep going and going and going that I never stop talking and start listening. God speaks through another psalmist in the 46th Psalm and says, Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Often our prayers of desperation are one-way communication. We cry out, God, listen to me. God, answer me. God, do this for me. God, work here. God, move like this. And we jabber on and on. The Puritan Matthew Henry once said, God gave us two ears and one mouth so that we may listen twice as much as we speak. Maybe God is silent because we're talking too much. Maybe we need to just shut up for a second. Maybe we need to be silent longer than it's comfortable. And that means maybe we turn off our TV We get away from our iPods and our iPads and our iPhones and our Facebook and our texting and our Twittering and our social media, and maybe we get away from people, and maybe it means that we go off into a quiet and isolated place and we sit for hours and maybe for days like the prophets and the holy people of old to hear the voice of God and say, God, would you speak to me? Do you want to hear the voice of God? The sons of Korah gives you... They give us three places where we go to hear God's voice. Number one, it is the Word of God. The first thing is the Word of God. In verse 3, the sons of Korah beg God. They say, God, send send out your light and your truth. Let them feed me. Another place King David would write, Your lamp, your word is a lamp unto my soul, unto my feet, and a light unto my path. Listen, God speaks directly to our hearts by His Holy Spirit. But if you want to find the sure Word of God, you need to go to the Scriptures. You need to be in the Word of God. Sometimes our feelings deceive us. Sometimes we think God is saying something to us, but it's really something we just want and we're just saying God told us to do it. But it's really our desires. But there is one place where we can go and be absolutely sure that this is what God is saying. That is his word. We often hear people saying, especially in our culture, follow your heart. But the prophet Jeremiah says that the heart is deceitful above all things. Who can know it? Often we run to other people for advice. But do you know that other people are fallible? Other people make mistakes. You might come to me and I might give you advice and I might be well-intentioned in my advice, in my advice but I could give you wrong advice because I'm human. I'm flawed. Only the Word of God gives us pure, unadulterated truth. The Scriptures are full of so many positive things. Every page of the Word of God is packed with good news. You can't say the same thing about your morning newspaper or Fox News if you like them or CNN News if you like them or the gossip you hear down the street. The Word of God is full of truth that reminds us of who we are in Jesus. Where do you go to hear the voice of God? You go to the Word of God. Number two, you go to the worship of God. Verse 3 and 4, the sons of Korah go on and says, let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling, and then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and I will praise you with the lyre, O God my God. You read this, and I can't help but feel sorry for this man. He still thinks that he has to go to the temple in order to worship God. Even as he speaks of praising God, he forgets that God is a spirit, that he's infinite, eternal, unchangeable. The temple cannot contain the presence of God. He's even there with other Levites on a chain gang far from home. Ezekiel was in an exile in faraway Babylon when God 
God showed up and showed him all of his glory. St. John was exiled on an island when God showed up, and St. John fell on his feet in worship before God. Abraham built an altar to God in the mountains of Canaan. Paul and Silas saw angels as they began to sing in a prison. You don't have to go to church to worship God. All of us who are filled with the Holy Spirit, listen, you are the temple of God. When you are inundated with the voices of despair, let me encourage you, lift up your voice in praise. Tell God who He is. Remind yourself who God is. Not for God's sake, not because God needs to be told who He is, but for your sake. Remind yourself He's a faithful God. He's a good God. He's a compassionate God. He's a forgiving God. He's a healing God. Remind yourself of the character of God. And as you do that, you can lift your voices in praise in the midst of whatever despair you're going through. Instead of complaining, sing to Him and remind yourself what God is and who He is and what He's done in your life. Lift your hands. Shout your way out of despair. Fill your mind with the goodness of God. Fill your mouth with the praises of God. And when you do that, I guarantee you, He will consume your life even in the midst of painful, challenging times of your life the worship of God. Number three, the witness of hope. The sons of Korah go on in verse five. They say, why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Now they're talking to their own souls. See, sometimes we just need to give ourselves a good pep talk. But we don't do it like Oprah Winfrey by positive affirmations about ourselves. The sons of Korah gives us a better way. As they end in verse 5, they say, Hope in God, for I shall again praise Him, my salvation and my God. Listen, the ultimate issue of life isn't who I am. The ultimate issue of life is who is God? Who is God? He is the great I am. And nowhere do we see his love demonstrated more than at the cross. Scripture says that God sent his only begotten son to redeem us out of our helpless condition. He experienced all of the despair that the sons of Korah and all of, this, all of us as sons and daughters of Adam and Eve ever experienced in our worst nightmares. The Bible says that he was called Emmanuel. God with us. Sometimes he is silent. And maybe he's silent because he's sitting next to us, sharing in our pain. He's the baby in the stable that was willing to identify with an unwed teenage mother and an out-of-work carpenter. He was willing to let the beasts of the field slobber all over him and even let us slobber all of our sorrows and all of our sins all over him as he took all of, us, all of it on him when he died for your sins and my sins. Maybe today you're tapping the message saying, is there any reason to hope? Is there any way out of this situation? Is there any way God can move here? And God says, I've come down to the deepest graves of your submerged wreckage to save you. And I will bring you up to glory. Hope always speaks louder than despair. You know, we live in a world of hopelessness. We live in a world where people are constantly telling us that it'll never get any better. And can I say that us Christians... We communicate hopelessness worse than anyone else. We talk about how the world is going in a downward spiral, and all we communicate is hopelessness. But can I suggest to you there is no better time to shine for Jesus than today. We who are filled with the hope of Jesus, if we let that exude out of our lives, what a difference that would make in the world that we live in in a world that's full of 
brokenness and despair and hopelessness, if the hope of Jesus consumes us, Peter would write in 1 Peter, it said, Christ in us, the hope of glory. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Think about that for a second. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That means anywhere you go, Christ in you, the hope of glory. You could be at a hospital bed, Christ in you, the hope of glory. You could be hanging out with friends and they are talking about despair and turmoil and how horrible the world is, Christ in you, the hope of glory. You could be in the worst of situations of life, Christ in you, the hope of glory. No matter what goes on around you, no matter what goes on in your life, may you be reminded that Christ in you gives you hope that he will see you through, that he is absolutely faithful to take care of you. We have that hope because 2,000 years ago, God sent his son. He lived the life that you and I couldn't have lived. He walked perfectly, blamelessly, without sin in his life. We should have applauded him. We should have put him on a pedestal. We should have put him on a throne and acknowledged his rulership and king, kingship in our lives, but we didn't. Instead, we took the perfect human, human being and we crucified him. He died the death that you and I should have died. He shed his blood for my sins and your sins. And because he died and because he gave his life for us, he says, now we are forgiven. We are cleansed we are holy, and he can now live in us, and we could say he is the hope of glory. This morning as we come to the table, we come acknowledging that we don't come with our own hope or our own ideas or our own schemes to change the world, but we come trusting that Jesus alone can bring change and hope. So as you come to the table this morning, I'm going to invite you to examine your heart, examine your attitudes, your affections, your desires. Would you let the Holy Spirit speak to you? Would you let him work in your life? And as you do, whenever, would you, if he calls you to repentance, would you repent? If he calls you to rededicate your life, would you rededicate your life? But whatever he's calling you to do today, would you do that? And then whenever you're ready, I'm going to invite you to come and grab the elements from the table. You're welcome to come whenever you're ready. And then I'll come back up here in a few moments and we'll partake of communion together. But let's just spend some time before Jesus as we worship this morning. Let's worship.